Farm Food Facts, where every farmer, every acre, and every voice matter. Welcome to Farm Food Facts for Wednesday, June 17th, 2020. I'm your host, Phil Lempert. This is probably the most serious topic we can discuss, hunger in America, especially these times during the pandemic that we were all living with. With us is Carrie Calvert, VP of Government Relations, Agriculture and Nutrition, and Ann Swanson, VP Strategic Produce Initiatives, both from Feeding America. Ann and Carrie, welcome to Farm Food Facts. Thank you so much, Phil, for having us here today. We're happy to be here. So I want to set the stage a bit um, of, of everything that's going on. Um, so according to ReFed, um, they indicate that 72 billion pounds of safe wholesome food does not make it to the kitchen table every year in our country. 52 billion pounds of food from manufacturers, grocery stores, and restaurants end up in landfills. Another 20 billion pounds of fruits and vegetables are not harvested on farms or left in fields to be plowed under. Uh, Feeding America, thank you, rescues 3.5 billion pounds of food every year and provides it to people in need. Uh, Carrie, let me start with you. How do we get that 3.5 billion pounds of food up to 70 billion pounds of food? That is such a tough question, and I'm lucky to have my colleague Anne here with me to, uh, to give us the answer to that tough question. Um, but I thought first I'd start with um, setting the stage of what food insecurity looks like um, right now and um, you know, how many people were in need prior to COVID-19. Um, despite uh, pretty low unemployment, um, let's say in February of this year, uh, about 37 million Americans were food insecure, which means that um, at some point during the year, they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Our uh, 200 food banks and 60,000 um, food pantries, meal programs, and soup kitchens that we work with um, provide food assistance to many of those that are food insecure. And um, many of those all people also are able to access federal nutrition programs like SNAP and school meals. And those all play such an important role in working together to help meet the need. Since the impact of COVID-19 and you know, an increase to over 40 million people filing for unemployment insurance, uh, our network has seen drastically increased uh, need. Uh, most food banks are reporting that need is double what they saw last year at the same time. And they also, um, you know, when we look at how long we think this will continue, we're estimating that another 17 million people on top of the 37 million are going to be facing food insecurity, which really makes it so critically important that we ensure that every resource can be utilized in helping to meet the need. So, Carrie, you know, we all saw the TV reports that you would have miles and miles of cars driving up to food banks throughout the nation. Um, there, there probably wasn't, you know, one state that wasn't hit. Um, that, number one. Um, number two um, is we're, we're facing higher food prices than ever before, even though the BLS report came out and it showed 2.6% uh, percent rise in food prices, that really didn't have much to do with the closures of, of factories, um, the closure of our borders. So we didn't have a lot of you know, imports coming in. So a lot of people are predicting higher food prices. Um, Certainly, you know, the government has said we're in a recession. Um, so we're, we're going to see even more people um, that, are, that are hungry and, and in need. And we are seeing a lot of retailers um, that you all are working with, you know, Publix, for example, um, in Florida, you know, trying to, to do their share. We're seeing other retailers throughout the whole country. So as, as you're saying, you know, probably another 17 million people are going to be affected how how do we get, and maybe this is, you know, the, the part where we get Anne involved here, how do we get that, you know, 72 billion pounds of safe, wholesome food in the hands of, of our hungriest and, and certainly in, in a drastic time of need uh, going from this point forward? Yes, we've had problems because of COVID-19, but every indication that I'm hearing, that I'm seeing, is it's going to get worse before it gets better. And how do we fix this? Well, I wish I had a solution, um, but I can start by saying that it takes everybody 
working together uh, across our network, across our nation. Um, I can speak a little bit about some of the innovative uh, things we've been seeing with the ag industry, um, but just to put some perspective on this, as we move um, on a normal annual basis, we're moving about 66 to 70% fresh and frozen products across our country to those in need. And um, a lot of people think of food banking um, as kind of a shelf stable sort of situation. And we do supply a lot of shelf stable food as well. But um, if you think about that, our supply chain is, is pretty well optimized, um, just like the regular food systems in our country. So when something like um, a pandemic such as this has such a big impact, it really puts a huge stress on our members um, to do what they normally do. And then on top of that, to move additional food. So I can speak a little bit more to some of those um, innovations and some of those partnerships. So yeah, let's, let's talk about those innovations. Uh, but before we do that, what are the messages that you both would like to get out to supermarkets, to consumers? I mean, what, what help do you need? Um, is it volunteers? Is it money? I mean, how do we, how do we fix um, this, this issue and, and this problem? Well, I think there's a role for everyone to play here. The federal government. I mean, I think what's unique about COVID-19 and the pandemic we're facing right now is that not only do you have so many people in need, but our food industry is also drastically impacted. You know, if over 50% of consumers were were um, eating meals away from home in the you know consumer facing food service business, where is all that food going? Right, that is a huge correction in the food supply chain that needs to happen, and uh, margins are so tight with um, food service business, with farmers, and with retailers that that is not an easy shift. Um, certainly, uh, it's hard for our food banks to be able to repack all of this bulk food. Um, so I'd say there's a role for the federal government to play in providing resources and funding to try to uh, repack this food so that it can be provided to people in need. I think there's a role for um, you know, uh, average people across the country, retailers, other corporations to volunteer. Many of our food banks have been um, relying on the assistance of the National Guard, but as those deployments wind down or they're needed to help with um, community unrest, uh, they're left with uh, there's still a huge need of volunteers to help pack and distribute all of the food that they're getting out the door. So I think there's a role for all of those things um, to play. And I also think I worry about our retail sector. I mean, we have such a huge, um, hugely efficient um, food economy in this country. I know we're talking about inefficiency in it as part of this, but by and large, America's food system is safe, secure, and affordable. And really that has had such a huge impact on um, the growth of, of our nation. You know, food security really plays such a key role in that. Um, but as I said, retail margins are tight. Food budgets are one of the first things to be cut when times are tight and you lose your job. So we really worry about um, the recovery of the, the food industry um, broadly and think some of the federal resources such as increasing SNAP benefits would play a pretty powerful role. USDA has been rolling out um, online pilots in a bunch of states so that people can purchase um, food online. I think that'll do a lot to help bolster our retail industry as they um, you know, try to recover from COVID-19. Their labor costs have gone up and they're seeing some supply shortages as well. I will definitely turn to my uh, wiser counterpart in terms of all things operational and to talk about some of the innovations they've been doing with the food industry to, to redirect some of this food. I would say that, one, since COVID has hit, we've, we've had just a, an immense amount of outpouring of support, both from uh, public and private um, corporations and individuals uh, you know, asking what can they do to help. And 
Um, so first and foremost, we're really looking at ways we can continue to partner with um, these, these, these people, um, people such as uh, freight providers, people such as um, that have capacity for coolers, uh, trucking, um, technologies. These are all, um, there's a lot of experts out there and these are, the, these are the experts that we will be leaning on to help us, um, like I said, even in a normal uh, year, but especially now during COVID. And what's been really interesting is even though there's been a decline in retail donations, which makes up a huge amount of our, uh, of our donations to our food bank members, um, we rely a lot on the ag industry and uh, we rely heavily on produce, uh, farmers and growers and packers, um, and as well as protein and uh, dairy farms. And one of the things that's really interesting is in a, normal, in a normal operation, our food banks would acquire donations from farmers. And these donations come in large bins. So a lot of field bins, we get a lot of that type of a sizing. And um, that's very different from the retail recovery where everything's small and packed and easy to distribute sizes. So one of the challenges we've had with COVID is the lack of volunteers that are available and the social distancing uh, protocols basically have wiped out our ability to repack potatoes and apples and onions and I mean, you name it. And so we've really worked quickly. The network and the food banks have worked quickly with our uh, grower and packer partners. Um, people have been looking for ways to keep their labor um, employed. And so they've set up uh, the packing sheds, have set up pack lines to help pack to smaller sizes. So apples from bins into bags. Um, there's been a, a 250,000 tons of potatoes were offered. Uh, I mean, what are we going to do with 250,000 tons of potatoes? And these are coming in unwashed, right? These are not coming in sizes that we can easily distribute. So We've had uh, tremendous support, I mean, pro bono support to wash and to pack uh, these, these products for us. And it is, it is incredible what the industry has done um, and what they're doing. And, and I hope that going forward, we will continue to innovate on, and think about how do we move to uh, smaller pack size? How do we get efficiency with what we do today? So, you, you know, you mentioned um, what's going on with the potato situation. What are some other examples around the country that have really impressed you um, and, and been innovative uh, to help feed um, all these people? Another example would be um, in our dairy uh, industry and also in the, in the, in the meat uh, industry, or we call it protein. Um, so, for example, on, our, on the protein side, uh, we've had a tremendous uptick in donation from the food service channels, um, because as you know, a lot of the food that's, that's being wasted right now, I hate to use that word, right? But that food is, is, was really directed for our food service channels. And um, so these come once again in large pack sizes, but uh, we, we've had producers willing to repack for us. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is we have established USDA clean rooms across our network in key food banks in areas across the country, such as Oklahoma. Um, and so it's important. We've, we've been innovating on how to accept more donations for, for quite some time. And so I think what's really interesting is a lot of the generous funding that has been available to us has allowed us to, in some cases, um, kind of expedite those opportunities. I mean, our plan is to triple the amount of clean rooms that we have available across the country. And, um, you know, people don't understand, I don't think, just how, how innovative food banks can be and how, um, how much on the front edge of operations that they want to be, because we recognize that in order to hit this 
enormous goal of, of feeding everyone across America, we have got to, it's a throughput issue, a lot of it, it's capacity. So uh, we're, we're really forward thinking and innovating um, in areas such as clean rooms. And, and Carrie, when you look at the nation um, and, and the state of the nation right now, as it relates to hunger, um, and you've, you've said, you know, very clearly that you're anticipating another 17 million people um, might go hungry and you're gearing up for that. What else are you seeing that that's keeping you up at night? Oh, gosh, where 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 to start? Um, I think one of the one of the things that's really concerning is with the uncertainty around schools and will they be able to open this fall? Will they not be able to? You know, we forget how critically important the National School Lunch Program is to ensure that um, children have access to nutritious food that they need to thrive. 22 million children receive free and reduced price lunch or breakfast through the program. And, you know, schools have done a remarkable job in trying to shift and provide um, to-go meal pickup at schools, but it's not reaching all of the kids in need. And uh, I think that is a big challenge. I mean, just in terms of the, the child care issue alone, I know that's going to be a big challenge for working parents as the economy um, in states tries to reopen. You know, we're hitting summertime, which is always a challenge to find affordable child care for many of the working families that we're serving. Um, I think the normal summer camps at the Y might have a hard time operating as we try to keep um, numbers low and socially distanced as the economy opens back up. Um, so we really, um, I think it is very unique to COVID-19 to see the impact that school closures across the country have had on um, children and their families that are facing food insecurity due to COVID-19. So I remember some years ago um, working very closely with Michelle Obama on the Chef's Move to School program and uh, right. traveling around the country with her and with Sam Cass and visiting uh, some of these schools. And what I found shocking is, as you point out, for a lot of these kids, um, that was their only meal that day, that they had to right. survive on, on that school lunch program. And then when we started to see some other programs around the country, like the backpack program and, and so on, um, that there, there was another problem that, yes, they could get a backpack full of food on Friday to take them over the weekend, but frankly, as they were walking home, uh, there might be another kid who stole the backpack uh, from them. So parents um, that were available um, had to go to the school with them to, to protect that food uh, from getting home. And, and when, we, when we talk about these kinds of programs, I don't think that the average American consumer really understands how difficult it is uh, for a lot of these people to to get a one good meal a day. Right, it really is a challenge, and I think um, you know one that you're right. The average person may not be aware how difficult it is just to access enough food to meet your family's needs. Um, certainly, um, you know. Uh, the pandemic that we're in has a way of humanizing need, um, you know, uh, in the media and throughout the country. And we are seeing a heightened understanding of the impact that food insecurity and hunger has on communities. I mean, just the school issue alone, you know, Congress um, provided um, authorization so that USDA can give a pandemic EBT card to families. Well, the authorization for that expires June 30th. And so, you know, if the Senate's not going to take up that legislation prior to June 30th, um, you know, just when the program's getting up and running, it's going to have to stop. And, you know, the, uh, one of the innovative things that we thought was pretty helpful about this um, USDA flexibility that they have for the pandemic is that um, it, uh, it gives families a safe way to have the funds that would normally be provided in the form of school lunch to their children added to an EBT card so they can safely shop at a grocery store or order that food, um, you know, and grocery pickup or something like that. So, um, you know, I think these things um, are, I mean, federal programs can be hard to understand for, for 
me and others that deal with them on a regular basis, let alone for the general public, especially when there's um, so many concer concerning things in the news today that, uh, that people are really worried about. Um, so that's just one example of, of how just accessing the breakfast or the lunch you need to grow and thrive is so much harder during this pandemic. Last question for both of you, and Anne, I'll, I'll let you answer first, and we'll go to Carrie. What do you want the food industry to know more than anything else, uh, whether it be a supermarket, whether it be a farmer, whether it be a rancher? What's that one message that you want to make sure that you get out? Well, I, I think for me, and I speak for um, all of the supply chain organization at Feeding America and across the network, we really appreciate and thank all of our partners for their super generous donations. Um, we can't do this alone. And we also thank the in-kind assistance we're getting from the industry. And I would say that uh, we, I would, I would challenge us all to really think about how we're going to continue to do this work once we get on the other side of the pandemic, because um, I think our fear is that maybe some of these donations will, um, will go away. Um, but I would encourage everyone to, to make donating to Feeding America, the, the, the food, the produce, the ag donations, manufacturing, uh, retail, it just, we need to continue to stay focused on it. And I also just personally want to recognize um, the farmers and ranchers and everybody in the industry across the country. We, we totally recognize that your businesses are also severely impact. Your communities are impacted. And, um, you know, I just want to say we're resilient. Our network is resilient and, you know, we, we stand with you. Uh Anne is a hard act to follow. I, I really do echo uh, what she says. You know, we know that our, our our donors and our partners are struggling right now and recognize the very real need we're facing. Um, and certainly we've we have seen um, donation partners across the supply chain step up to help out during these trying times. Um, we've also seen them step up and work with us to, to tell this story of, of need and uh, the reconnecting that needs to happen to get the available food to those in need. Um, you know, so when they work with us to tell our story to the federal government, whether it's USDA or Congress, we can be so much stronger together when we, um, when we you know, collaborate and advocate together. And I think our voices are so much stronger when we can, when we can do that. Well, thank you both uh, very much for all the great work that you at Feeding America is doing uh, these days and, and hopefully continues uh, to, to become even more important in everybody's lives. Um, and thank you for joining us today on Farm Food Facts. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to today's podcast episode. For more information on all things food and agriculture, please visit us at usfarmersandranchers.org. Also, be sure to look for us on Facebook at U.S. Farmers and Ranchers or on Twitter at USFRA. Until next time.